The next topic that we're going to look at with respect to molecular mechanics force fields is using them in the context of simulations. So a simulation is a, a large scale computational experiment, if you will, that is designed to look at the evolution of a system either with time or to look at the possible configurations of a system in an ensemble sense uh, that can be accessed and involve, involving large numbers of molecules. So because of the large number of calculations that may need to be done in terms of following a system in time or exploring many, many ensemble configurations, there's a need for an extremely fast method to compute relevant quantities like energetics or structures, and as a result, force fields are a natural choice. So we'll be discussing simulations primarily within the context of Monte Carlo sampling techniques and molecular dynamics sampling techniques, and we'll begin with that now. I will mention that uh, over the course of the next few videos, some of the slides that I'll be using have been taken with permission from uh, uh, work created by Professor Howard Main, who's in the Department of Chemistry at the University of New Hampshire, and I thank him for letting me include those in these presentations. So up till now, I have uh, emphasized that, you know, from a drawing perspective, we often restrict ourselves to a single dimension because, well, because that's what's easy to draw. And as noted here, when you do that sort of drawing, you're often hiding quite a bit. And so, uh, you know, one way to think about a reaction going from a reactant to a product, and in this case, by the way, that would be an uphill uh, process, but in any case, here's a well and here's another well. And this set of squiggly lines, the sort of gray and red lines, those are two different trajectories, we might call them, that attempt to map out on the one dimension that we really have a reaction coordinate, that's this dimension. So this is energy, and this is a dimension. Uh, map out the behavior of a system. So if you follow this gray line, which may be a little hard to see, uh, because it's buried under the red line. But in any case, it goes back and forth, squiggly wiggly, all over the place. It comes up here, it gets over this barrier, it comes back a little bit, it goes back again, and ultimately it falls down into this product well. And so we might call that a productive, because it made product, uh, trajectory that traverses from reactant to product. The red trajectory, if you will, the reason it's red presumably is that at the end of the trajectory here, the arrow is pointing back, even though it got over this transition state, uh, this nominal barrier, nevertheless it never fell down to product, it came back. And incidentally, the trajectories themselves are likely indicating total energetics. And the reason that the total energy can go up or down is that you're bumping into various other molecules, and so you may, as one molecule, acquire extra energy that wasn't there uh, because another molecule lost energy. So energy, of course, has to be conserved, but one individual trajectory may be one individual molecule reacting. Incidentally, if you hear some banging in the background, that is the high-tech heating system here in Morrill Hall trying to keep my office warm, so sorry about that. Now, in any case, what I want to point out to you is that by compressing this all into 1D, we are actually missing a lot of what's going on in this trajectory. And so, for instance, here is a better looking surface that has energy in one dimension but two coordinates and shows various ways that a trajectory coming in from some, uh, uh, some set of coordinates, P and Q, here, here, or here, might go about getting down to a low energy uh, region of the surface. So these are just different paths that a reacting molecule might take. And this is uh, just a rotated view of that as well, and it's just illustrating on, uh, uh, again, a two-coordinate surface with energy in a different dimension, how you might get from one minimum to another minimum over this transition state. Here's something leading to a different product. Uh, there are obviously complexities, something we've, we've visited several times when it comes to potential energy surfaces. So an interesting question that arises, and one I've tried to deal with here and there is, how might one go about finding the global minimum? The thing about potential energy surfaces is that, for the most part, 
The surface is a vast wasteland from a chemistry perspective. There are many, many regions that are super high in energy. Atoms are too close or they're not bonded. They're of no interest to a chemist. They might be accessed if you were on the surface of the sun, but uh, in the laboratory, they're just they're not relevant. So what you would really like to do is take that massive high dimensional surface restrict yourself to rather small portions of it that correspond to, say, a particular set of connections amongst the atoms, and that defines the molecule. And even there, it's relatively rugged, possibly, especially if it's a big molecule. And so you might want to know, what's the global minimum on this surface? And as noted here, this is a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. How do you, in fact, find the lowest energy minimum in a surface that looks a lot like a quite complex mountain range and somehow you've got to you know, survey it and you don't have the luxury of flying over in a helicopter and using your eyes, you've got to come up with some algorithm you can tell a computer to implement that'll move your molecule into the lowest energy minimum or minima, you may be interested in more than one, but still you want the low energy ones. Okay, so a system in thermal equilibrium, if we let it uh, go to absolute zero in temperature, will be at its global minimum. And uh, the trick here, of course, is to say that it's in equilibrium. We haven't said how long it might take to get to equilibrium, but nevertheless, that is something we know. At very low temperatures in our universe, systems will want to be at their lowest possible energies. So the, the issue of increasing the efficiency of looking for global minima is still an active area of research. And I'll say a little bit about kind of common ways that people attempt to do this using simulation techniques. So what are the possible strategies you might use? Well, one possibility would be just to systematically search all the coordinates. And that is uh, obviously just an impossible task as the number of coordinates rises. You can't sort of hold all but one fixed, scan along one, and then hold that one fixed and start scanning along another one uh, because obviously if the number of coordinates is say 100 you are generating n to the 100 points where uh, excuse me if, if you take 100 points and you've got n coordinates you're going to just be computing so many times that it doesn't matter that a molecular mechanics force field is fast it's just not doable so another approach is to do so-called quenched dynamics so Imagine that you make your system very, very hot, and as a result, the uh, dynamics of the system is that the atoms are zooming around all over the place, bonds are stretching, you can access many regions of the potential energy surface because you have so much kinetic energy tied up, uh, and then you suddenly lower the temperature and the system falls down into the wells and you survey the minima you fall into, and I'll, I'll have uh, some pictorial examples of this soon. Simulated annealing is really a, a rather similar idea. You heat the system up and you cool it very slowly, but it's usually used in the context of a Monte Carlo search, and we'll see that uh, shortly. And then finally, there's, there's interesting work that's appeared in the last couple of decades uh, associated with evolutionary or genetic algorithms. And uh, those kinds of algorithms refer to propagation techniques that involve using sort of rules of survival. So you have a way of evaluating the the goodness of an individual confirmation and if it's not a good confirmation it's allowed to die out and it doesn't poison the population with its bad genetics and then you mix good ones together in a way that gets you to better and better ones. So uh, mostly we're going to be focused on this uh, second and third one. The first one's impossible. I'm not going to talk about genetic algorithms much but the molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo approaches to doing these uh, dynamics with quenching and simulated annealing. And in order to have this discussion in a more meaningful way, I want to uh, introduce the concept of phase space. And so really that's going to be the, the key new concept in this lecture. And to do that, let me, let me discuss it in a, a relatively simple context. I want to talk about a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. So phase space is the space that's characterized by the momentum and position coordinates of all the particles. Right, so normal space is the position of particles, and phase space means that you add an additional coordinate associated with each position coordinate. There's also a momentum coordinate. So if we were in three dimensions, we would say one particle, there would be an x position, a y position, and a z position. 
and the particle would also have momentum in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Now for convenience, we're going to choose a one-dimensional case. So there is only a single spatial dimension. We could call it, well actually let's call it Q. So a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator is a mass on a spring and it can only move back and forth and so if I pull it in this direction those will be positive values of Q and if I push it in this direction that is a negative value of Q relative to an equilibrium distance which I'll just define as zero. All right, so the e if the spring is completely relaxed, there's no tension in it, then uh, where the mass sits we'll call that zero. So if I pull on the spring, I'll have a positive value of Q. If I push it, I'll have a negative value of Q. Now, because it is a spring, if I pull on it, there will now be a restoring force acting on the mass. And if I let go, the mass will begin to move. It will develop momentum in the uh, negative direction of the coordinate. It will pass through the equilibrium distance. It will then begin compressing the spring and ultimately the restoring force on the spring will stop the momentum, all the kinetic energy will have been converted into potential energy, and the spring will then push the mass back out. And in the absence of friction, of course, that will go on forever. We'll have a nice perpetual motion machine. It's not allowed in thermodynamics, but this is not a course in thermodynamics, so we won't worry about perpetual motion machines. So phase space, then, for this one-dimensional case, has two dimensions that I would graph in, I can illustrate the activity of my particle in a spatial dimension Q and in a momentum direction, sorry, dimension P. That is, a point in phase space is defined by the two coordinates Q and P associated with that point in phase space. Now, I, I could certainly generalize that for n particles in three dimensions of space as being position for particle 1, position in the x direction, y direction, z direction, and momentum in the x, y, and z direction. And then again there would be six coordinates for particle 2 and six for particle 3, all the way out to the final six for particle n. But I can't graph that very well. So the reason I'm restricting myself to the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, which has a two-dimensional phase space, is because I can actually graph a trajectory. So let me indeed come back then to this idea of I begin my mass stretched by a distance b from the equilibrium uh, uh, distance of the spring, the resting position of the spring. And so I'm holding it right there, it's got no momentum, so in phase space I would put a point right here at position b and momentum zero, it's not moving. And when I let go of that mass, it will begin to compress the spring, and so my position coordinate is uh, dropping, it's getting smaller and smaller, and meanwhile my momentum, which is negative because I'm traveling towards the wall, is becoming larger and larger. I hit my maximum in momentum when I am passing through the equilibrium distance, and you can go back to your basic physics of springs if you want to check that out, and I'll then be here. I'm at the equilibrium position, I have uh, maximum negative momentum, and now the spring begins applying a restoring force, so my momentum is dropping, 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 dropping. For a perfect spring, I will compress exactly as much as I used to be stretched, so now I'm at negative B in position space, and now I begin being pushed back. So my momentum is positive, I'm being pushed away from the wall, it's going up, 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 until I hit a maximum uh, once again at the equilibrium position and now the spring begins restoring as it's being stretched. This trajectory in phase space, and so the arrows are just giving you an indication of the motion that would occur, the trajectory in phase space is periodic. All right? In the absence of friction it goes on forever. Notice that if I were not to have stretched the ball out quite as far, let's say I stretched it out a distance of A, which is less than B, I would trace out a trajectory in phase space that would again be an ellipse in these two dimensions and it too would be periodic. So note an interesting feature about trajectories in phase space. Either they are periodic and they do not cross one another or they go on indefinitely and fill up all of phase space in an infinite amount of time. 
you cannot have two phase space trajectories cross one another. And the reason for that is they're deterministic, essentially. If I am at this exact point, for instance, in phase space, that dictates precisely where the next point must be. I know my momentum and I know my position and so that's going to tell me where I'm going. So were I to have a trajectory cross, somehow I'd have a point in phase space that could lead to two different possibilities and that violates classical laws of motion. You can't just go two different places from the same position and, and same momentum. So phase space is kind of an interesting place and the trajectories in phase space are themselves similarly interesting. So that's just to emphasize that. No two trajectories in phase space can cross. So a system is either periodic, in which case there are infinitely many trajectories, none of which cross one another, or it samples all of phase space in an ergodic fashion. And what ergodic fashion means is uh, you will spend more time in the lower energy regions of phase space than you will in the higher energy regions. So the density, if you like, in phase space is associated with the usual rules of our universe again, that you are uh, more, more probabilistically found at low energy than high. So how does one go about following a true phase space trajectory sufficiently accurately? And now I'll let you think about that in time. So imagine in the harmonic oscillator, instead of solving the equations analytically, which can be done for the harmonic oscillator, what I did was I took rather small time steps. So I'm going to go back a step here. I'm going to imagine I could compute the force here. I know which direction I have to step in, and I would take a certain step. And hmm, actually, maybe the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator isn't the best example. Let me indeed stay in some arbitrary space. So I know forces on all my atoms. And I uh, know which direction I need to move them all. In a real system, they move infinitesimally little in their respective directions, and there will be new forces on them, the forces are constantly developing, that will continue to move them maybe in different directions. But in practice, I can't take infinitesimally small steps. I need to take some real-sized step. And as a result, so if this is a true trajectory in phase space, this nice curvy line, what's being indicated here with the smaller arrow is I'm going to take some step that's a straight line. I'm going to move things along the direction that force says I should. And I will no longer actually be on the correct trajectory. Hopefully, I have not moved so far from the correct trajectory that I can't now take another step and continue to map out relatively accurately what the positions and momenta of all the atoms should be. Because remember, that's what a point on this line in phase space is. That point is the collection, the vector, composed of every position variable and every momentum variable. And it's deterministic. Whatever it was here dictates what it is here, dictates what it is here, and so on, all the way along the curve. And so if it seems, if it seems somehow trivial that, oh, sure, of course you would follow along like this, by no means should you believe that to be the case. And if you want to think about why it might not be, uh, imagine a bond stretching, actually. So maybe the 1D harmonic oscillator wasn't so bad. Imagine a bond stretching, and I take steps that are too large. So I've got, I've got this ball displaced here, and I know it's going to move in that direction, but I decide to take a relatively large step in time relative to the time it would otherwise take for the mass to get from here to, say, here. Right, so if... In, let's say it takes one second just to have a number to pick. If it takes one second for the mass to get from here to here, but I decide I'm actually going to take a two-second step. Why? I don't know. It was just some number I picked. Well, given the force I see, if it takes about one second to get to here, two seconds, I'm maybe going to decide to move it here to this rather unphysical value of negative whatever it might be, call it C, which has inverted my spring in a way. So I'm going to go and compute a spring energy that's going to be wacky. I've got uh, a negative compression. And as a result, probably the algorithm I use is going to predict an incredibly powerful restoring force. And as a result, I'm going to bounce my ball. Actually, I guess I'm going off the screen here. 
uh, even further out, and then I'm going to compute yet a stronger restoring force, and suddenly my ball is going to be catastrophically flinging itself to the ends of the universe because I took steps that were too large. I shot way off this trajectory, and so the next move might be way down to here, and the next move way up to here, and I'll be looking at regions of phase space that are uninteresting, so high in energy that they would never be accessed except at you know, stellar temperatures. So when it comes to doing molecular dynamics, uh, which is a case where you do indeed take steps associated with time, very small time steps, maybe a half a femtosecond, are not unusual. And it's exactly because of those vibrating bonds in molecules that you need to take very short time steps. You can't afford to drive the two atoms directly into each other uh, suddenly be computing forces associated with near nuclear fusion repulsion and uh, suddenly shooting the bonds out to very long lengths. You'll, you'll just have nonsense at that stage. All right, so uh, that is the end of what I want to accomplish in that video, thinking about phase space trajectories. When we go on to the next uh, video in the series, we'll actually look at doing Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics sampling.